about a thing. And we have that right. The, the most powerful thing that God has given us is the mind. And even now we have the mind of Christ. Amen. So, so this is the thing. What, I'll repeat it. I've said it so many times. That the thing that makes us like God or in the image of God is not how we look. Come on, somebody. No, it is the ability to make decisions. Amen. Amen. Take that away, you have socialism, communism, all that kind of stuff. We have the right to make our own decisions. That is the power that we own. Come on, somebody. And so do you realize that how many believers uh, still don't know how to make decisions? Why? Because the old nature has taught us to go with the flow. Come on, somebody. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want no issues. But I got news for you. You will have issues if you don't learn how to make biblical decisions for your life. Amen. I mean, it's powerful. So anyway, uh, um, so we, we realize that our divine nature is what leads us into the impossible. Hey, all right. So uh, um, the Bible is full of miracles. The Bible is a book of miracles. Would you agree? Amen. Yeah. From Genesis to Revelations, that's all you see. And, and you know, if, if, if we don't grab a hold of the fact that as believers, our life has to accept the miraculous. Amen. So, if we say we believe in the Bible, then we have to believe in miracles. Come on. If we say we, we believe in the Bibles, we have to accept the fact that, that miracles need to happen in our lives. The day you and I came to the Lord, that was a miracle. Yes? Right. And anything after that, my friend, is going to be a miracle. Why? Because the Bible is asking us to do things that are impossible for us in our natural state. So I just read, I mean, I just told you about 2 Corinthians 5, 17, right? That you are a new creature. All things are passed. And we go like, Phew, it goes. Because, well, wait a minute. I can't relate to that. The Bible says, you're more than a conqueror. And, and we go like, man, I just finished, finished failing. No, you're not here. The Bible says, you know, that, that you, by his stripes, you have been what? And you go like, yeah, but man, I'm in denial because my nose is running and, and all this kind of stuff. No, my friend, listen, the Bible speaks to us in a way that causes us to come up to God, not him to come down to us. Amen. Yeah. And, and, and that's challenging for a lot of people. In fact, a lot of people go like, I'm tired of being challenged. You can't be tired of being challenged. This is going to go on for the rest of your life. And if you're tired of being challenged, close your Bible. Amen. Because the Bible is always going to challenge you. It's not the preacher. I mean, it's easy to blame me. Though, though I, I can't imagine anybody blaming me, but it's possible. <laughs> Are you following me? Right. You're going to be challenged. Why? Because the Bible challenges us. The Bible is calling us to operate and to walk in miracles. And miracles, my friend, is not, is not always the stupendous, right? A miracle can be you finally uh, 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 breaking a habit. Hey. Yeah. I mean, a miracle, you know, people always want the big miracle. Listen, a miracle can be uh, uh, any one of us finally saying, man, you know what? I got a, I got a hold of my finances finally. Come on. Yes. So anyway, we're going to go to John chapter 5, verse 1. If I, may su if I mess up, it's Junior's fault. I love that guy. Amen. John chapter 1. I mean, chapter 5, verse 1. Yeah, that's that. It's kicking in. <laughs> it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. This is, guys, this is, um, I think, his third miracle. Amen? We've been going through, through the miracles. 
Uh, next verse says, Now there, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Now, remember, I had said before that the miracles of Jesus, we can read them and go like, man, that is awesome. But there's so much to it. There's so much more to it. Amen. We have to kind of read between the lines because Jesus never came to do miracles so people can applaud him. He never wanted that, though people did. He came and did miracles so that they can understand a couple of things. One, prophetic prophecy. Yes. And two, so that they can understand that we are like him. The Bible says in 1 John, as he is, so are we on the earth. Amen. Uh, listen, man, the, the, we're coming up close to Easter. The passion of Christ was not for us to watch it and go like, oh, my God, and cry and so on. It made me cry. I can't watch the thing, you know. Um, but, but that's not the purpose of it. Amen. The passion of Christ is to show us what he did for us so that we can be like him come on amen and so a lot of times we we go to church and we hear a great message well that's awesome it, it, it shouldn't be awesome at that point it, or even if it is that's fine but you need to take that with you and you need to practice that which we're learning so that we can be the christ on the earth okay so people think after Jesus resurrected, that's it, he was gone. No, my friend. In fact, he never left. Because the Bible says that he is in. Oh, two, two of you know that. Praise the Lord. Christ is in us, so he's still on the earth, but he's living in us. Yes? Watch, next verse. It says, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, Blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. King James says, the stirring, the stirring of the water. Next verse. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. That's awesome, right? So allow me, please, just a moment to break this down. Is that okay? Amen. Our church is not meant to get people excited emotionally. Come on. Though that can happen, and it should happen. Amen. Uh, but that's not the purpose. Our purpose is to help you understand the Word of God that will cause you to be a success in every area of life. Amen? So now watch. So the Bible says that he, uh, um, that Jesus uh, came to go, to, go back to verse 1, that he came to a place called Bethesda. Amen? And uh, it was the time of the feast, the Passover feast to be exact. And, uh, and then verse 2 says, it says that, that in Jerusalem, he went by the sheep gate. Now, everything is important, guys. And if you know anything about the sheep gate, and you probably won't know unless you study Nehemiah, right? And when the walls were down, and, uh, and, and Nehemiah, God called Nehemiah to come and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And, and they started doing that, but the gates were still down. So the sheep gate was the first gate that they restored, okay? The sheep gate was the first one that they restored. Why? Because the sheep gate was where they would bring the sheep and the lamb, lambs to be sacrificed unto the Lord, the shedding of blood. Yes? And so it is significant that it was this place that Jesus comes to and he starts ministering. It is in this place that they have the pool that is, that, that is stirred once a year by an angel, and nothing is, nothing is a, uh, 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 it's not a coincidence. Are you still with me? Watch, the next verse says, 
Now, a certain man was there who had for an angel, <laughs> a certain man, who would like to start, get it. Is Junior still up there? Probably not. Now, a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. 38 years. Now, watch this. The guy who rebuilt the door of the sheep gate it was the high priest, uh, Eliashib. And, uh, and the first thing I think that we as believers have to understand that we have to accept the death and resurrection of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, right? A high priest was the one that restored it. Now here comes the high priest, and he is going to cause one of the greatest miracles that the people have seen. Amen? So it says that this guy was there 38 years. Next verse says, When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made whole? And that is kind of nuts, right? First of all, what it tells us about Jesus is that he knows everything that we go through. He knows where we're at. He doesn't judge us. Amen. Sometimes we don't even want to look at ourselves, but Jesus knows us. He knows your condition. He knows what you're going through. Amen. He's a high priest that can relate to every infirmity, every situation. Amen. So he knew what this man was going through. He understood that this man was there for a long time, and he asked him the question, he says, uh, uh, do you want to be made whole? Now, if you know him, Jesus, then you know that he's been here many times. He has no money, so he can't pay anybody to help him. Uh, I mean, he's, he, you know, he's, he's, had, he's had it hard, and you're going to ask the question, do you want to be whole? Now, y'all need to stay with me. Yeah, you need to stay with me. Because what, what Jesus was addressing was a defeatist mindset. Come on. He had been in that condition for so long that now he was just going through the motions. Now he would still get there, but he had no intention of being, of being made whole because he, had, he, he knew that every time he would try to go in his condition, it was difficult that somebody else would come and get in. But yet he fell into, y'all stay with me, he fell into this mindset of just going through the motions. And Jesus had to stir that up in him. He had to bring him back to why it is that you're here. Well, y'all not hearing me. Why is it that you, you come every year? And, and so he's been in that condition for 38 years. He's probably been there 38 years. Been coming every year 38 times. Well, hello? So he asked him, why do you want to be whole? Well, to us, the answer is Yes. But to him, he had to work through years and years of failure. Come on. See, the miracle is not just that fact that he healed them. The miracle is that he broke the mindset that kept him in that place. Come on. Are y'all with me? Yeah. And, 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 and you have to realize... Uh, guys, that because sometimes we don't fully understand the Word of God, we, like we think, you know, when you get saved, you think, man, from here on in, I'm going to be perfect. And that's a, that's a setup because we're never going to be perfect. And then we get down on ourselves when we fail. And, you know, if you only fail once or twice in your life, man, you're on your way to heaven. But the fact is that we fail over and over, and some people fail more times than others. And, but yet, they still know enough not to go away from the truth, and not to go away from God, and not to go away from the church, but they're just going through the motions. Can I keep it real, guys? Amen. And, um, <laughs> and so... Jesus says, hey, I know who you are. I know where you've been. 
I know your condition, but I need to bring you up to the place of faith again where you can believe in spite of your failures, in spite of what you've been through, and in spite of your condition. So I want to know. I need to know. But probably you need to know more than me. Do you want to be whole? Do you want to be well? It's a valid question. It's a valid question today. There's people that feel like, man, I've, I've, I've gone so far away from the Lord that there is no real restoration. I know he's forgiven me. Yeah, yeah, he has. But do you want to succeed? Come on. Do you want to conquer? Do you want to go and fulfill the vision that he has given you? Hey. Hallelujah. So, um, his answer is, in the next verse, the sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. So his answer, he didn't answer Jesus' question. He didn't. He reiterated his issue, his problem. Come on, are you here? You know, I mean, he could have said real simple, yes, but he couldn't. Because he had to work through a defeatist mindset. In his mind, he was still thinking about his failure and his inability to enter in. Now look, consider this. Right? First of all, there were five porches there. That's the number of grace. The name Bethesda means uh, 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 the, the, I'm going to tell you in a minute. I mean, it's why we take notes, right? So it means the house of mercy and grace. Come on. The guy was in the right place at the right time every year. The problem was that he could not get his mindset to change to the point where he believed that this was his time. Are y'all here? Amen. Now consider this as well. I mean, that was the pool, right? The angel would come and stir the waters. And, and, and a lot of times the Bible speaks of the word as water. The angel, the, the name angel means what? A messenger or pastor. So perhaps today, this messenger is stirring the word in you. The Lord saying, you know what? This is your time. You can sit here every Sunday, every time we come together, and if you're not careful, we'll just go through the motions. But every time that the word of God comes forth is an opportunity to receive our miracle. Come on. Amen. Amen. I mean, th th that's what this is all about. What, what it's talking about, sometimes when we... Uh, 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 don't understand that God wants us to go up, right, to where he is because he already came down. He's not going to come down again. He came down to bring us up. Amen. And we have to continue to look up and say, you know what, today, this day, I will receive my miracle. Amen. That's up to you. That's up to you. You know, because it's interesting that, the, that Jesus came to the guy that perhaps had the worst issues. Amen. He came to him because he realized that he's the one that needed the greatest miracle of all. So, but again, instead of him saying, yes, I want to be well, he goes, you don't understand. And y'all stay with me because you know how we uh, 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 dialogue with the Lord? 
You know, I stayed away from saying we argue. I'm, uh, uh <laughs> use the word dialogue. That will suffice, right? But we go like, but Lord, you don't understand. The preacher stirs the water of the word and, 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 and says, man, today can be your deliverance. Today you can receive your miracles. And then in the mind it says, well, I don't know, I've been there before. Uh, it didn't work before. Um, you don't understand. I don't have a man. I don't have anybody lay hands on me. Y'all ain't trying to hear this. Yeah. Because, listen, man, the time of, you know, the preacher with all the answers and all the annoying thing, that is gone, man. It is time that we start teaching people that Christ is in them, the kingdom is in them, the word is in them, the anointing is in them. <laughs> Amen. If we want the church to be the church, then we need to raise up people that believe that they have what it takes to bring forth the miraculous and to bring forth healing. I mean, what's the point, man? I, you know, I've been around for a while. I've, I've been to services where people just glorified the preacher because he came across as the, the most holy and the most anointed. And, and they would even say it, you know. If you're having issues, come up here. I'm going to lay hands on you. I have no problem laying on the hands. I believe it's biblical. But what I do question a lot of times has been the motive. Because if your deliverance is in my hand. I can manipulate you. Amen. It's the truth. And God knows there's been manipulation in the church. Many of us has, have experienced it. Amen. You know, well, you know, I can't, I can't wait to go to church to the pastor lay hands on me or the evangelist or, or the prophet. Listen, they all have a role in your life. The role is not to live your life. The role is to equip you. That's what Ephesians, come on. Yes. Amen. So that if somebody's sick in your household, lay hands on them. You have the right. You are a son and a daughter of the Lord. You have his anointing inside of you. But, you know, the guy was like, I don't have a man. I need a man. Now listen, we need each other. Don't, don't go overboard, okay? We need each other. We're a family. We need to encourage one another. There's a lot of verses uh, that talk about one another, okay? But what I'm saying is that we can have the mindset that somebody else has to do it for us. That doesn't work. And so, so Jesus tells him, you know, do you want to be well? Well, you don't understand. You know, I, I have nobody that, that can help me. And I love what Jesus says. Because it is the place of grace. Amen. Jesus overlooks that because his heart is to heal him. And I thank God for that because a lot of times, my friend, we are messed up, jacked up. We can't even believe, and by his grace, he does something. But that, that doesn't mean that that's the way he wants to do it all the time. Because the truth is, my friend, that what he's after is for us to mature and for us to grow so that, so that somebody won't have to do it for us all the time. We can now become the conduit by which he can use us to bless somebody else. Yes. You know, the, like there's been times I said, how many of you want to see a church grow? All hands go up, but nobody does anything. <laughs> amen. Yeah, they, I know it's hard to clap and to say amen, but, but it's the truth. You know why? Because we're fighting a mentality that says if anything's going to get done, the pastor has to do it. Hey, am I good? Still doing good? Y'all don't hate me yet? Next verse. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. Awesome. Awesome. The word rise there means to wake up. Thus, the question, do you want to be made well? Because right now, you're asleep. 
Right now, you, you gave up on your dream. Right now, you gave up. It, it's like you, you fell asleep on your vision, on your dream. You're just going through the motion. So he's saying, rise, awake. Come on. And a lot of times, my friend, we just need to wake up. If you, if you, I'm, I'm, listen, man, I know that what I'm saying is kind of challenging, but I live it every day, right? I'm no different than you are. The fact is that you can get into a mode where you're just going through the motions and you fall asleep. Amen. We have to wake up to the fact that he is still Lord. We have to wake up to the fact that he is still healer. We have to wake up to the fact that he is still provider and that he loves us and that he calls us kings and priests and he calls us sons and daughters. We have to wake up, my friend, to who we are. Guess what? This pandemic put a lot of people to sleep. It sure did. Some of them are still asleep. You know, so they, they're still going like, well, I don't know. And I told you, when I was out in, 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 uh, in Florida with my friend, uh, uh, Pastor Rudy, um, and, you know, he, he's right there. I mean, his church is gangbusters, man. I mean, really. And, and so we were encouraging churches to reopen. Now, some people said we were like, you know, you're irresponsible. How can you say that? What do you mean, how can I say that? It is irresponsible not to open the church. I mean, we are the church, man. We're the body of Christ. We say we believe in the word of God, then let's move and prove it. Well, anyway, this pastor came up to us and he said, you know what? He said, would you pray for me? Because I don't know how to do it. How do I open up again? Now, that seemed like a real naive question. Right? My first response is just do it. No, no, my friend, we're dealing with a mindset. He fell asleep and he doesn't know how to reopen the church. And don't tell me that this whole thing has not been a spiritual attack on the church. Yeah. And, and that was sad to hear him say that. It was like, you, you really don't know what to do? No. He's been, remember what I said before? It takes 30 days to establish a habit. This thing has been going on for a year. Hello? It's time to wake up. The church needs to wake up out of its slumber and say, you know what? We are who God says we are. And what happens is a lot, you know, what happens is that we have the tendency whenever we face adversity is to go back to our comfort zone. Amen. So now think about what Jesus was telling me. He said, rise up. Take up your bed. The thing that you had your confidence in. His bed became his comfort zone. So even though, my friend, even though he wanted to be healed, he, you know, that, that was the thing he was used to. And, and he was telling him, take up that, your comfort zone. Put that thing on the back, and now you walk. Walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 13, verse 11 says this. And do this knowing the time that now, the time that now is, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Now those of you who've been in my class on salvation and, and saved and, and born again, you're, you're probably totally confused by now. <laughs> but you will understand what he's saying. He says when you, your salvation is never open, your salvation is, is to be carried out here on earth. That's why the Bible says work out your own salvation. It's something you work out. It's a progression. Amen. And so what he's saying is wake up because now you're nearer than you were before. Don't fall asleep now. 
Don't fall asleep in the process. Yeah, you can say you've been saved 20 years, but maybe at some point you fell asleep. It's time to wake up. Amen. Why? Because it is time. Now is the time. But you don't understand. You don't understand what I'm going through. You know what's interesting? Uh, um, let me say most, most of you know this, and I always take that for granted. But when Elijah, um, one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, when he, when he you know, was called by God, he, he was bold, he was powerful, he confronted the king, and so on and so forth. But then he got to a place where Jezebel wasn't impressed with what he did. And she said, by this time tomorrow, your head is going to be cut. And the Bible says that he worked himself into a cave. He went into a cave, a cave of depression, a cave of despair. And, and the first thing the Lord tells him is, Elijah, why are you there? You don't need to help. I don't know who this is for. But somebody's going to grab a hold of this, and your deliverance, my friend, is today. Amen. He says, Elijah, why are you there? And Elijah, just like this man, started telling him his issues. Well, I'm the only prophet left. They killed everybody, and here I am. And the Lord does not answer him. Hey, he doesn't. Then he asked him again. Elijah, what are you doing there? Like the Lord was saying, I don't get it. I called you. You stopped the rain for three and a half years. You have in First Kings chapter nineteen. Well, he didn't, the Lord didn't tell him that. Of course, I'm telling you. Uh, 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 you destroyed all the prophets of Baal and so on. Why are you there? Why are you in that place of discouragement and despair? And come on, why are you there? Guess what Elijah does? Same thing as this man. Well, uh, uh, you, know, you know, I'm the last prophet, and this happened, and this happened, and the Lord does not answer him. I, listen to me very carefully. The Lord is not going to get into a dialogue with us when we are discouraged and so on. He's not going to go like, well, I'm going to tell you why, Robert. Pick on me. I'm going to tell you why. It's because this happened and that happened and so on. No, no. He, he, you know why? Because the Lord did what he was going to do. And when Jesus gave his life and, and shed his blood and died on the cross, we're coming close to that, and rose again, he did it once, the Bible says, and for all. And for all. Because now, whenever we get into that thing, that's that nature, the old nature, complaining and so on. And God does not want to respond to the old nature. You know why? He doesn't believe in the old nature. He gave us the nature of Christ. Amen. Amen. And so then, Elijah hears a still, small voice after an earthquake. Come on. <sighs> and you can see him. He's, he's the prophet of fire. He's the prophet of action. And when he hears that earthquake, he said, that's it. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about, Lord. Come on. But the Bible specifically says, and the Lord was not in it. Then he is thunder. <laughs> yes, come on. Come on, let's do this thing. And the Bible says the Lord was not in it. And then a still small voice speaks to him. And you know what it says? It doesn't say, poor Elijah. It doesn't say, look, I got your back. Don't worry about it. You know what it says? Get back to work. See, it's, <laughs> some of you are looking at me. Did he really say that? Yes, he did. He said, go and anoint Haziel as king. And go, he put him back to work because he realized that your issue is that now you are thinking that, that somebody owes you something just because you did some good thing. Oh, you're not hearing me. 
He says, your identity and your power and your grace is in doing my work. Stop crying and stop complaining. Amen. Amen. I know it's rough. But it's not coming from me. Remember, you can't point your finger at me. I'm just the messenger. Amen. I've come to... <laughs> I've come to stir you up. Yeah. Amen. So listen, so, so the same thing happened with this guy. Well, I don't have a man. You know what? Cut it out. No, really. He says what? He says, pick up your bed. Rise up. Pick up your bed and walk. My friend, and it's not that easy. It's not that easy because, because now he had to shift into a whole new arena. Y'all need to help me. And it's why a lot of people don't rise up. Because he knew when he rose up and took up his bed and started walking that now he had to deal with a whole different deal. He had to be responsible. He had to get a job. If you can walk, you can get a job. Come on, somebody. Now, now you have to go and, and witness for me and do all these things that you have not done for 38 years. And you know, sometimes, sometimes we'll sell our deliverance to stay in the comfort zone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like, man, if, if I get delivered, then I'm going to be responsible. God forbid. <laughs> so the mindset is not just the fact that he was in that condition. The mindset is what the conditioned, right, restricted him from doing. And after a while, we can get used to it. Do you realize that God, and the title of this message is, Your Miracle is Waiting for You? I put it on Facebook, and this one lady said, uh, you mean, uh, no, she said, uh, you mean in the future, not the past. And she totally missed it. So I just simply wrote back and said, in the present. Come on. Your miracle is not in the future, my friend. Your miracle, Jesus paid the price for your miracle. The, and the reason that Jesus did what he did, he, he didn't have to like muster it up. You notice that when, when you, get up and walk. That's a simple why. Because in, in the kingdom, my friend, in the kingdom of God, there is no lame. There is no sickness. There is no poverty. Come on. And Jesus, the king, walked in his kingdom here on earth. He prophetically told them, when you pray, pray in this manner. It was prophetic. Come on. Our Father who art in heaven. Come on, y'all good Catholics, you know this. <laughs> Come on. Hallowed, holy be thy name. Thy Now we know all the ex-Catholics. <laughs> Amen. I was brought up Catholic. I ain't tripping. Uh, are you following me? <laughs> uh, are you following me? So, so Jesus was saying, y'all don't get it. Because you keep thinking that the kingdom of, is up there and the kingdom is here. Right here. It is, you're the one that chooses what you walk in. So it wasn't like, you know, everybody, oh my God, look at, whoo, look at that miracle. And Jesus said, no, that's normal for me. That's normal. Do you need a miracle? You don't have to answer that because every single person in this house and, that who, and that's listening by YouTube or Facebook Live needs a miracle. And if you think you don't, that means that you've entered into a place like that man where you can't even answer. What is it that you want? 
Amen. And so this preacher is stirring the water of the word. And you have to rise up, wake up, and pick up the thing that you feel has been hindering you all these years. Because you, now you have authority over it. It no longer has authority over you. And decide to walk by faith. Amen. Amen. So he was made well because he obeyed the words of Christ. Right? After all, he still had the power of choice. Yeah? Rise up. Well, I don't think so. Hey. Pick up your bed. Nah. No, I kind of like it. Are you still with me? And some of us think, how can anybody think like that? It's pretty simple. The thing that Moses had to deal with more than anything with the people that, that were in Egypt all those years was their captive mentality. Do you think a miracle can change that? Absolutely not. In fact, this man, after the Lord delivered him and so on, he could have, and who knows, he could have gone back to his old ways. Why? Choice. And God comes and delivers the people through a series of miracles. He parts the Red Sea. He does all those are miracles, my friend. And yet they could not shift from the old mindset. Why did you bring us here to die? No, in fact, he brought you here to live. So you can finally be out of bondage, but they, they wouldn't get it. Are y'all here? Amen. And amen. So in my remaining minutes, I'm going to try to cover another miracle. Amen. The reason that we're going here, my friend, is because the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You've been praying for a miracle for so long that maybe some of you have given up. And the Lord is saying, don't give up. Because the deal is that though Christ was there at the sheep gate, right? And then that one guy got it. The fact is that Christ is with us right now. He's the same one. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is still the miracle-working God. Come on. Amen. All right, real quick. John, chapter 6, verse 1 through 14. And I, I mean, I'm going to breeze through this. It's kind of warm in here. Thank you, Freddie. You're the only one with me here. <laughs> Everybody go like. <laughs> no, this, it's, it's kind of warm outside. That's why. Amen. That's a hint to whoever deals with the air, which they're not getting. <laughs> they have an old mindset. <laughs> Amen. Listen, John, this is the next miracle after the one that we just talked about. I'm going to go through this briefly. Stay with me. John chapter 6, verse 1, it says, after these things, what things? We just talked about them, right? After he healed that guy. It says, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Ti Tiberias. Next verse. Stay with me. We're going to move, move through. Then a great multitude followed him because they saw his signs, which he had performed on those who were diseased. So they're the ones that saw the miracle of the guy, right? And so then when Jesus left, and they followed him. They go like, man, you know what? This, this guy is on to something. Next verse says, and Jesus went up on the, on the mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Come on, move it. Now the Passover, a, a feast of the Jews, was near. Again. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now stop right there. So here we go. 
Jesus goes. They, he wants to spend time. By the way, I'm going to be doing a series. Could you have been a disciple of Jesus? Don't, don't let that right there. Amen. Uh, but he went with his disciples, and, you know, he said, man, we're, we're going to chill for a minute. But all these people are coming because they saw the miracles, and they wanted to uh, uh, partake of his anointing and so on and so forth. And Jesus lifted up his eyes. He saw all this multitude. Then he asked the question to Philip, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, keep in mind, right, natural, supernatural, the world system, the kingdom of God, old nature, new nature, right? Jesus asked him a question, where shall we buy bread that these may eat? His answer is, next verse, but this he said, oh, here we go, but this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Is it possible that before a miracle, there's a test? Come on. And is it further possible that if we fail the test, the miracle is not manifested? Come on. So Jesus asked him, hey, hey. Now, he, later on, it tells us there was over 5,000 men there, let alone women and children. And he says, where can we buy food for all these people? Now, as we're thinking about this, you have to understand that he was alluding to, when he said where, he was alluding to the fact you have the world system and you have the kingdom. You're not hearing me. Where can we buy food for all these people? Well, certainly not in the natural. The answer, we're going to see in a minute, the answer is where we can buy all this food is in the kingdom. Or what some have called, I think Paul Yonggi Cho wrote the book, The Fourth Dimension. Before him, in 1952, the guy wrote a book, The Fourth Dimension and the Bible. It's kind of boring reading, but if you like boring reading, I would, <laughs> I would suggest that to you. So what he was saying is, now, you just saw the miracle that happened. You saw how I healed that guy. Now, here we are in a situation that seems impossible. Where do we get food for all these people? Now, if you're a disciple, by now, you ought to get it. You ought to say, well, the same place we, that man got his healing. Come on. The same place where uh, uh, the water was made into wine. You're not hearing me. Where is it? The kingdom of God. Yes? But watch. Next verse says, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little. So he went where? The world system, the natural. Y'all need to help me because your miracle is waiting for you when you, when you dare to walk by faith in the kingdom of God. What you need is not in the world. What you need, you can't get from a, from a doctor or from a therapist. Or from, no, no, what you need, my friend, is in the kingdom. And you've heard me say before that faith is the currency of the kingdom. So he said, where are you going to buy it? Well, uh, uh, all we have is, what, 200 denarii. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the other currency, the currency by which you can buy the impossible, the, cur the currency that you can buy a miracle. It's called faith. Amen. It's called faith. So he was saying, hey. But it's interesting because he said, I'm asking you this. And then it says, just to test you. Hello. I just want to test you. You guys been walking with me? You guys know what I'm saying? You have seen the miracles. 
So I want to ask you, where can you get the finances you need not just to make it, come on, but to be a blessing? Where can you get, and and hear hear it now, where can you buy your healing? Somebody, you can't buy healing. Yes, you can. With the right currency. Come on. Where can you buy your promotion? Where can you buy your healing? Where can you buy a successful marriage? Where can you? Oh, you're not hearing me. It is not the world system. We already tried it. It's why we came to Christ to begin with. We came to him so that he can restore our original image and likeness. We came to him so that he can restore us to our rightful place in God. No, no, we're not supposed to operate in the world system no more. Well, let's see what the next president is going to do. Who cares? (laughs) I've never seen anybody fall upstairs. I couldn't help that one. Amen. No, seriously. No, no, it has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with the economy. It's, it's what I'm telling you. That's why we, we didn't stop supporting missions and so on because the money was not coming from the world. Come on. And so the question is simple. He asked two questions. First one in the miracle with the guy, he said, do you want to be made well? Well, he already knew the answer. He is Christ. He's the healer. But he wanted to stir up that man's thinking. And the same thing here with the disciples. You see the multitudes. Wow. What? what, what where can we buy? You're in the desert, dude. <laughs> where, where can we buy food for all of them? He, know, he knew. The Bible says it. He was just testing them. Because he knew what he was going to do. You know what he was going to do? Operate in what he always operated in, the kingdom of God. Listen to me carefully. There cannot be a kingdom without a king. Amen. And so then, next verse says, I'm almost done. This is good. One of his disciples, Andrew Simon, Peter's brother, said to him, next verse, there is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? So my question was, is he being sarcastic? Hey, is he going like, (laughs) because you know there's some people that are so pragmatic, they push faith out the door, out the window quick. Because their mind does not allow them to believe for a miracle. And so here, you know, uh, yeah, we got five loaves. Yeah, five loaves and two fish. Work with that. Watch, next verse says. Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. 5,000, five loaves of fish, I mean uh, of bread. Come on. Number five again is what number? Number of grace. You put five and two together, five loaves and two fish, you have what number? Seven, the number of rest. It's why he says, sit down and rest. We got something for you. Amen. Watch, next verse. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, hear me very clearly. Thanks is the entrance into the kingdom. Thanksgiving opens up the door to miracles. Y'all ain't trying to hear me. Yes. It's when we get into this mode of complaining and, and, you know, and questioning and so on. Instead of giving God thanks for what he has done and what we truly have. Are you here? So he took the five loaves. He didn't say, well, this is not enough. 
He took the five loaves and gave thanks. Listen to me very carefully. Thanksgiving is the means by which things multiply. You all have to hear me. Whenever you feel like complaining, stop it and start thanking him. Yes. Start thanking him. Thank him. So it says he sat everybody down. Next verse says. So when they were filled, because they gave it out to everybody, he said to, the, to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Next verse says. Therefore they gathered them up and filled how many baskets? Twelve baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had, who had eaten. So, yeah, 12 is the number of the divine government. Are you with me? So, here, all these messages that, that, are, that are given by the Lord through miracles. What did people get stuck on? The miracles. The miracles are good. We need them. But let's not forget the purpose for the miracle. Let us not forget that he is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He will not only do a miracle just to get you out of a jam. He will keep you. He will continue to cause you to grow and to, and to multiply and so on and so forth. Why? Because that is his purpose for us. Amen. Yes. And amen. Praise the Lord. Gee, I think I'm going to take some of that alcohol every Sunday. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> Amen. Miracles. Your miracle is waiting for you. You know, I always used to tell people, you know, just wait on the Lord. Really? They'll go like, man, I'm going through it. Just, just wait on the Lord. How many, right? And after coming to the understanding of who God is and what Jesus did on Calvary, or what we call the finished work, I realize that God is waiting on us. And we keep saying we're waiting on the Lord, and the Lord is saying, well, I did my part. I paid the price. I shed my blood. I suffered on the, on the cross, and I rose again. What are you waiting for? Your miracle is waiting for you. Your miracle is waiting for, for, for you to wake up to another level of faith and another level of his grace. Your miracle is waiting for you to, to stop going back to the comfort zone and to burn it. No turning back. And to now say, Lord, I'm going to walk by faith. But remember, your faith is going to be tested. Yes? James says in, in chapter 1, for the testing of your faith produces. The Lord wants nothing but production for our lives. He wants nothing but multiplication for us, but he says, wait, there's a test. It's called the testing of your faith. And it's the testing of your faith that produces the miracle of God. Beloved, don't ever, don't ever give up when you're tested. It's all it is, it's just a test. The Bible says, examine yourself. Guess what that word examine means? Test, the same word. Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Are you all here? Your miracle is waiting for you. 
Your miracle is waiting for you. You know what you battle now? A mindset that seems like it can't grasp that truth. It's a mindset that says, man, I, I've heard tons of messages. I've been challenged. I've been this. It's, it's just like the man saying, I have, uh, you know, I've been here many times before. I just don't have a man. You don't need a man, my friend. Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. How many people, please, think about what I'm about to say. How many of us here need a miracle? Raise your hand. Oh, amen. I want to see if every hand is up. Yes, every hand is up. Because if you don't need a miracle, I'm going to have you come up here and pray for everybody else. Sure. We all need a miracle. And guess what? Some of us had to think about it. You know why? Because we've been believing for a long time. And it hasn't happened. And that's why I asked the question. Because I wanted you to think. That's right, man. I've been believing for this. I forgot I was believing for that. Yeah, that's what happened to that guy. If you believe a miracle, and it's true what the Word of God says, that your miracle already exists. You don't, have to, you don't have to convince God. You don't have to fast 21 days for God to give you a miracle. The miracle is not God saying, okay, let me, let me send this down now. No, it already exists. It already exists. It already exists. Where? In the kingdom. And faith is the currency of the kingdom. I want to challenge you. Believe again. I want to challenge you to, to awake, to awaken your faith and to say, you know what, Lord? Now is my time. Now is my time. I believe it now. I receive it now. And then what happens? The testing of your faith. That's the part we don't like. That's the part we don't like. Yes, Lord, I'm believing for the, my finance. I told you, Lord, that I wanted, I believe that I'm going to be a millionaire. The testing comes, and the little you have is lost. Hey, that's it. Not believing anymore. I trusted you. I believed you, and you failed me. No, my friend, you failed the test. I can tell you time and time again when Norm and I have believed, and, and I told you guys before, the best thing that happened to us when we got saved, we got saved in 1979, and in 1979, we got married, and in 1979, we got into ministry all at the same time. 1980, they sent us to Chicago to head up a ministry. The main ministry was in Pennsylvania, and they had a home in the city in the north side of women, working with women. And they said, we have a need there. The directors are kind of burnt out. We said, well, we'll go and help. It doesn't matter. We, at that point, man, being delivered from drugs and all that in New York City, I would do anything. Y'all don't know. I was so happy. And, and so they said, you got to go to Chicago. Chicago? I, I come from New York, man. Send me someplace warm or something. You know, Chicago. Never been to Chicago. All I hear is bad things. Al Capone and all that good stuff. And, uh, but anyway, we came. We were not even saved a year fully. And when we got to the home, the home had like 16 women hardcore crack addicts, heroin addicts, I mean, hardcore. 
And the minute that we walk in, the director has a suitcase by the door. And I looked at the suitcase. I said, mm, that don't look good. His wife was pregnant. And they said, we're out. I said, but we were sent here to help you. They said, well, you're going to help us by staying here because we're out of here. And they left. And here we are, barely a year old in the Lord. We didn't know what we were doing. The only thing that I knew was the drug addict's mindset because I had been on drugs for so long and I can relate to these women. Are y'all here? And year, then years after that, I asked the Lord, Lord, why did you send us? And I remember, listen, give me five minutes. I remember growing up and my father being abusive to my mother. I'm talking about he would beat her silly. And I was so little and so defenseless and hopeless. I couldn't do anything. And I, I, I would get so angry. He brought that to my mind. This is why I sent you here. Now you have a chance to defend and protect these women like you couldn't do with your mom. Amen. So... I, you know, I said, you know, okay, Lord, here we are. And about a week later, we get a knock on the door. Some of you heard this before. I open the door, it's the landlord. We had a big old house. And he said, uh, I said, yes, how can I help you? He said, I'm here for the rent. I said, oh, okay, um, can you give me a few days? I'm going to need to talk to headquarters. So, boom, close the door. I get on the phone. I call headquarters in Pennsylvania. Hey, when are you going to send the check for the rent? The landlord was just here. I said, what check? We don't send no checks. Then what are we supposed to do? You're supposed to pray. <laughs> now, look, I guarantee you, if I was saved like five years or ten years, I would have been gone. But because we, weren't, we were saved barely a year, I took it all literally. Okay, okay so then that's what we'll do. <laughs> so my wife, Norma, Norma, Pastor Norma and I went into the office, and we, did exact, we didn't even know how to pray. We said, Lord, you see these people coming for the rent. We need the rent money. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's about it. Literally, the next day, that knock on the door, and I go like, oh, man, I told the guy, give me a few days, man. You know? So I open the door, and this guy puts an envelope in my hand, and I grab the envelope, and he takes off. I said, yo, but who are you? What? He just takes off. You know, the Bible says sometimes we entertain angels. We don't know it. So I open the envelope, to the penny is exactly the rent money. Oh, you're not here. You know what I said? I said, well, shoot, this is good. This works. Why do you think that the Lord chose 12 guys that had, did not have a clue? He didn't go to the doctors of the law. He didn't go to the Pharisees. He didn't go to the cemeteries, I mean seminaries. He went to fishermen that did not have a clue. Why? Because those are the people that God can use. And every day after that, we pray and God would provide. We taught the women, just pray. I remember a, 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 a little kitten that they loved in the house ate rat poison and just was gone. And they brought up the little kitten, and, and, and they brought it up to the chapel, and he's dead, he's dead. And then one of them said, well, then let's pray. And they started praying, lay hands. And we, I was there. We were like this. I had the, the kitten like this. And they lay hands. All of a sudden, it felt like electricity. <laughs> the cat jumps up and starts running. You're not hearing me. We were, we were touching the kingdom of God because we have faith we had no choice I'm here to tell you 
that your miracle is waiting for you. I want you to stand to your feet. And now, after 40 years of ministry, it's too late. People go, what are you going to do? What do you mean, what am I? I ain't going to do nothing. But my God, my God, but my God. I believe in the power of agreement. If you're here today and you say, I believe that God is releasing my miracle, then I want you to come up here quick. Don't worry about time. Who cares? Who cares? You know, there's some people that go like, oh, man, it's late. You mean you're going to miss your miracle because it's too late? No, no, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come on. It's been stirred up in you. It's been stirred up in you. It's been stirred up in you. God is speaking to us. Amen. It's been stirred up in you. God is speaking to us. Amen. God is speaking to us. It is our time. Come on. It is time to wake up and say, you know what, Lord? I could never walk before, but I'm going to walk now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I've never had enough before, but now I'm going to have more than enough in Jesus' name. Lord, I've never been healed miraculously, but now I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus Lord, I've never seen my business take off the way I want it to. But now it's going to take off. It is miracles. It is miracles. It is miracles. In the name of Jesus, we have to believe it. We have to embrace it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are people of the kingdom. We walk in the kingdom, not by sight, but by faith. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, raise your hands all over this place. Enough is enough. We don't want to play church no more. We don't want to make excuses why we don't receive our miracle. No, Lord, right now we have the faith. Right now, Lord, we know in the name of Jesus that every miracle that you promise is yes and amen. It's for us. And today, we put a demand, Father, on that which you have given us. You have given us prosperity. You have given us healing. You have given us breakthrough. In Jesus' mighty name, we receive it right now. Come on, tap in. Tap into the kingdom. By faith. By faith. Remember, thank him. Thanksgiving. Thank him by faith. Thank him by faith. Thank him for your miracle. Thank Him for your miracle in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Worship and praise Him. Yes. That's who He is. That's who He is. There's no turning back. Come on, sing it to him. Yes, Lord, we thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. That's who you are. That's who you are, Lord. That's who you are. Listen, listen. The battle, my friend, is why Jesus addressed that guy the way that he did. The battle is not outside of you. The battle is right here. It's your mind that's going to try to convince you that it's not going to happen. It's your mind that's going to say, man, you know what? They've prayed for you before. It is your mind that you have to now submit to the mind of Christ. And look, 
you believe it. Don't you dare let go. Don't you dare go back to the comfort zone. And this is what I'm going to tell you. There's going to be testimonies. And when you receive yours, we want you to come here and say, I receive mine. Amen. Amen. Because that's how we honor the king. That's how we give him thanks. Thank you, Lord, because you did it. Now, I know this. How many of you have had a miracle before? That's right. He did it then. He'll do it again. And I'm not this smart. I'm not, oh, well, let me do this uh, series on miracles. It don't work like that. The Lord is the one that has instructed us to go there. You know why? He knows everything that we go through. He knows it. And even when our heart gets hard, he reminds us, what is it that you need? What is it that you were asking me for? Because he wants to fulfill it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Somebody lay hands on David. I'm going to pray for him right now. Hallelujah. He's receiving his right now. Remember, a miracle doesn't necessarily have to be money. Come on, somebody. A miracle can be a deliverance that happens inside of us. A deliverance can be a breakthrough in our relationship with God. Father, I thank you for David. I thank you for touching him right now. And I thank you, Lord, for building him up in his holy faith. Right now, I declare and decree, we agree in the name of Jesus. Father, for his miracle is his. It belongs to him. You have given it to him. You have kept him. Lord, you, Father, have have been with him every step of the way. And right now, we declare in the name of Jesus that his miracle is manifested now, right now, in Jesus' mighty name. And we thank you for it, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. Guys, stay focused. Stay on it. Stay on it. Listen, right away, if you see something that seems to be contrary to your miracle. What is it? It's a test. That's all it is. It's like what you hear on the radio, right? You're listening to music, and all of a sudden, bang! you're like, what the heck? And then it says, this is a test. Your radio's not broken. There's nothing wrong with your hearing. It's a test. It is only a test. And we saw it in the Word. His word came to test them. That's all. You hang tough. Don't give in. Don't give in to that nonsense and that mess. Your miracle is yours. Amen? Give the Lord praise. Come on. Come on. Give it to him. Give it to him. Praise the Lord. Give it to him. Amen. 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 Woo! Yes. Yes.